Okay. Uh, Recording is now in progress. (laughs) So yes, as uh, Kirsten said today, what we're going to be talking about basically is how you use an archive. Mm -hmm. Um, Specifically, you know, how can you make the most out of visiting an archive? How can you make the most out of the resources that are there? Um, and, and what's kind of the best procedure for working with the archive um, or any archive? I mean, you know, if you were here for our first session, you might remember us talking a little bit um, just about how, you know, archives in certain ways are, are can be a little bit different than libraries and how you might be familiar with, you know, going to libraries. Not going to be the exact same type of uh, process as if you go into an archive. At the same time, archives can offer quite a bit um, and, and quite a bit of specific material, um, which can really aid research, you know, especially if you're trying to do very sort of um, uh, specific research related perhaps to, as we're going to talk about, specific primary resources. And we'll go over what that means. Um, you're going to find that archives are really going to aid you greatly. But again, it can be helpful to know before you go in just a little bit about what to expect and just a few tips about how, that, how best to have it work. Mm-hmm. And what I'm going to do right now, if you'll pardon me for a moment, is I'm going to start uh, to screen share so I can Excellent. bring up the PowerPoint here real quick. Go into the slideshow. Okay. Excellent. Oh, right. Okay, we are. We're there. great. Um, can everybody see this? And also, can you all hear me? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yep. So over the years, I have spent a lot of time working in archives. I am not, unlike, unlike Ryan, I am not an archivist by training. Um, but what I am trained in is how do you use the resources available to you when you actually go to a physical archive or an institution with an archive? And how do you actually do research in a way that is going to not only help you answer the questions that you come in with, but also open up new questions that you might not have even thought to ask in the first place. Um, So the key to doing work in an archive for me is to be open to what you find. Be open to the sources as they present themselves to you. Let the sources tell you their story rather than telling the story that you want to tell based on what you think you're going to find. So openness is key. So when you go to an archive, The thing that you are mostly going to be working with are primary sources. Now, what are primary sources? Primary sources are what we call the evidence of history. Um, Primary sources are original records that were created by people who either observed or participated in the event or the historical time period that those records come from. Um, So it could come in the form of a memoir, it could come in the form of an oral history, but primary sources really run the gamut of things. Primary sources can be letters and manuscripts, which means uh, manuscripts are handwritten materials, um, handwritten books. Um, They can be diaries or journals, they can be newspapers, they can be maps, especially if they're hand-drawn maps, speeches, interviews. If it has come from a person or a group of people, that generally means that it is a primary source. Now, secondary sources, you're also going to find those kinds of things in archives, but secondary sources, most of the time, that is research about the primary source. It's going to be an interpretation of, it's going to be research based on whatever that primary source happens to be. So when you go into an archive and you want to do research, most of the time you're really going to want to dig in with those primary sources, those materials that you're not going to find anywhere else. Because most of the time, these primary sources, they're one of a kind. They are, um, they are singular in, in their existence. And so what they are and what they have can tell you very specific things about groups of people, a person, a life, an institution, piece of local history, and it can go on up. But they to know that they are irreplaceable and that they can tell you something that no other document can be able to tell you, that's really 
that's really the, the joy of looking at primary sources because they're all going to be different and they're all going to be strange looking. They're going to require you as the person going in with questions, the person going in with a research idea, they're going to require you to engage with them. Like you can't be a passive person when you go into an archive and do research. It's so active. And I think that's part of the exciting thing about it is that it is so active. So when you go in, be prepared, be prepared to do the research. So getting ready to conduct that research, oftentimes for me, it means writing down the questions that I have beforehand before I even go to the go to the source itself. I have a list of questions that I am interested in pursuing. I don't have a list of answers. I don't even have a list of theories or ideas. All of my questions are open-ended. Um, and so they're designed to help me navigate the resources that I might find. So write down those questions before you start have a general sense of what it is that you want to talk about and a general sense of what it is that you um, are interested in learning about. So as you do that, uh, write down search terms because the first point of getting into any archive is to learn how to navigate its search system. So to learn how to navigate its database, um, write down keywords, write down topics or phrases things that when you plug it into the computer, um, what's gonna come back out at you are a list of potential, potential sources for you to check out. So keep track of those words, keep track of the, the terms or the ideas that you're interested in. And um, for me, who you don't wanna see my research because my research is scattered. It is not organized. Um, it exists in many different places, in many different forms. But the thing I tell everybody to do is the thing that I don't do myself is decide on a method of keeping your results and your notes organized. Don't be like me and keep a notebook here, a notebook there, computer files on a number of different devices, some things in Google Docs, some things in EndNote. Don't do that. Pick one place, pick one notebook, have one folder, have one computer file, have one Word document, have one place that is the centrally organized place for your questions, for your ideas, for your terms, and also a place where you can start building out what it is that you find when you go to an archive. So, like I said, the first thing that you're probably going to do when you get to an archive is you're going to sit down at a computer and you're going to pull up um, whatever search engine they have in place that will search through everything that has been cataloged. Um, so make note of this, know that there are ways to kind of get around those search engines, that ways to navigate them that will actually give back to you the things that you might be interested in seeing. Not necessarily the things you're looking for, but the things that you're interested in seeing. So in order to filter those results, and so in order to kind of make sense of what it is that you're actually looking at, what you might be interested in seeing, start building out those key terms in ways that will be helpful to you when the results come back on whatever search platform that the archive has in place. Um, you know, use and, couple your phrases together, uh, use or, separate them out so that the results that come back is going to be one or the other thing. Um, you can eliminate things. If you know that you're not necessarily, for example, like I have here, if you're not necessarily interested in histories or aspects of homestead steel that don't necessarily involve Carnegie, eliminate him from the search, get him out of there. So you can manipulate a search in order to produce results that you think that you might be interested in. Again, not necessarily the things that you want, but the things that you might be interested in. If I can jump in yeah, to please do. From an uh, archivist perspective yeah. as well. Um, when we uh, build essentially on our end search engines that you use when you either come into an archive or in the case of some archives, you can access this, you know, before you go in even online. So for example, at Rivers of Steel, if you were to go to our, if you were to go to our website, um, we do have our 
archival holdings basically uploaded mm-hmm. and searchable on there. Um, but it, basically, you got to remember, um, p- the people who create those databases are human, right? And if it's a data entry thing, they're kind of entering that data um, on a human basis, meaning this, right? Uh, unlike even, say, searching the internet or you're searching, you know, if you just punch in, I don't know, Car- Andrew Carnegie into the internet, right? You're going to get probably millions of search results just from, you know, across human experience here. In, in the case of working in archive, chances are you're going to be drawing from a much narrower pool of data. Basically, where I'm going with this, if you're in an archive and you're searching for something and it doesn't come up and you can't get it to come up, begin to consider if there's another way that it might have been entered right? Is there something else? So a good example. If you're punching in, um, you know, at, at an archive, maybe we'll just say um, U.S. Steel. Um, and for whatever reason, something's not coming up. Um, maybe you want to try USS. Maybe, you know, you want to try, depending on the era you're talking about, maybe what you actually think is, oh, maybe they have another Carnegie Steel. Maybe it's Carnegie, Illinois. Um is you know it, you just want to try a lot of different a lot of different search terms you know if you're maybe another you know um, I'm just thinking of things that might for example be in our arch- uh, in our archive you know you're searching in you know mill because you're looking for pictures of mill nothing's really coming up maybe try the specific names of you know maybe the Cary furnaces Duquesne works you know um, uh, uh, J and L in the case of J and L try Jones and Laughlin and try J and L just, you're going to get different search results. Chances mm-hmm. are, you know, archives have in them tens of thousands of different items. Right. And oftentimes when these are, these, these databases are created, it's created by multiple people across multiple different years. So if you're all this to say, if you're in an archive, and you're not finding what you're lo- looking for, just try different things. Out. Yep. And that goes back to um, the writing down the search terms to get you started write down all of the, any possible permutation you can think of, right? Like Ryan said, if you're interested in, okay, U.S. Steel, write down all of the versions of that that you can think of that might turn up Mm -hmm. up hits. Be as expansive as you possibly can in those initial searches, because like he said, the, the tagging and the data entry, it is a very human process and different people are going to look at different materials in different ways. And so the results that you might want, if they're not coming up, if the things that you're interested in aren't coming up, they're probably there. It's just, you have to just change that keyword a little bit. So make a list and go down that list. Use every permutation that you can you can think of. Try to be as inclusive as you possibly can rather than at, at the outset. You know, as you start, be as expansive as you can, be as inclusive as you can. And as you go, that's when you can start to narrow things down a little bit more and a little bit more. Because one of the things that will often come at you when, when the search engine spits back possible, possible results and possible um, documents or artifacts or objects, things that you might be interested in looking at, take a look at how they're tagged because there will be a list in that search that comes back to you. You'll be able to see the different markers that have been used to identify that object. So look at all of those and see, oh, okay, I wasn't getting this hit from US Steel, but this has also been tagged with JNL, or this has also been, this has been tagged in different ways. And now write down all of those tags. And so now you have another bank of those tags to use that you can help refine the search even further. Okay, let, me, so, let me jump in for a second with the yep. US Steel part. Um, and this is from years of experience with it. Um, U.S. Steel, JNL, same thing. Those are those are more uh, vernacular names, you know. When it's U.S. Mm-hmm. JNL, when you're looking for legal documents, especially if you're looking online, you're probably not going to find it with U.S.S. or JNL. Right. You will find right. it under United States Steel Company or right. United States Steel Corporation. Jones and Lachlan Company or Jones and Lachlan Corporation, depending on the era. Mm-hmm. Point is, and this is just to reinforce what they've been saying, is don't just give up and think, ah, oh, it's not there. Mm-hmm. There are a bunch of different ways you have to come in to kind of mine down towards to that. And even within an archive, as Ryan said, there will be inconsistency in these terms. Mm-hmm. So try all these different doors mm-hmm. and you'll, you'll find 
perhaps not what you thought you would find, but you will find something very interesting, which will lead you down another road. Right. I was to say even one, one, one other thing, I mean, even on a certain level, you know, if, if, if an archivist, and this, trust me, this happens, if an archivist doesn't know what they're looking at, but you might, so again, you're looking for pictures of, let's say, a, a specific building in Homestead, perhaps, right? Um, that, you know, maybe the person who entered it in, they don't know what it is. So maybe you want to try something like, instead of looking for the name of that building or the name of that church or whatever it might be, just start by looking for general pictures, you know, or asking for pictures that have of Homestead, that have the word Homestead in it. And then once you're in there, you know, you can take a flip. Because there is always going to be, that is the thing about working in archives, is there's a certain amount of picking through different documents that you inevitably mm -hmm. have to do. Um, but, you know, always try for those kind of um, back doors to find what you're looking mm -hmm. for, to see, you know, like, like Ron said, really, just don't give up. Don't give up until you've kind of spent some time playing around seeing what you can find, because in a lot of cases, really what you want often is there. It's, you know, it's just kind of buried. Right. right. Or just um, keep in mind that the archivist oftentimes only knows the information they were presented with. Right. Mm -hmm. For the document. Yep. And then know that information and technology changes over time. So original tagging systems that might've been in place, say in the early nineties, are not necessarily gonna be the same things that you use 20 and 30 years later. So, um, you know, that's just to reinforce and reiterate everything that they have said, know that things change over time, um, tags change over time, methods and modes of identification will change over time, and it will change depending on who is working on what and when, don't give up on it because it's not giving you exactly the thing that you think you are looking for right off the bat. Because more likely than not, it's going to be there. It might not be in the form that you initially want it to be in or the form that you initially expect it to be in. But it might, let's say you're looking for a particular letter and you know that that letter exists somewhere. What happens if it doesn't come back as a letter, what happens if it comes back as a diary instead? Or what happens if that letter has been attached to a photograph? You have to kind of be open to the results that come back in your initial searches, not necessarily matching your expectations and being able to open up and alter your expectations to meet the material that is coming back to you. And so even if you might not want to look at that particular manual or that particular drawing or map, um, look at it anyway, because perhaps, perhaps it actually has the thing that you were looking for. It just hasn't been marked that way. Or perhaps it has something else in it that is interesting and that might even be more interesting to you than the original question that you came in wanting an answer to. So what happens then when you get to an archive, you talk with the archivist, you get a kind of a sense of what it is that you're looking for. So the archivist knows, all right, they're interested in looking at, let's say, if you're me, I'm most of the time, I'm going to be looking for um, women's history related things. So let's say I'm looking for um, women working at homestead between 1935 and 1960. So oh, the go. archivist, the archivist is probably going to be able to help me right off the bat, be able to help me pull materials and like thinking, oh yes, I know what this is. They're going to be able to pull things for me. The search engine is going to throw things at me. So I'm going to be able to ask for or request certain kinds of material that kind of match what it is that I think that I'm looking for. So when that happens and you get a big box of material delivered to you at your table and you are ready to dig in and actually start doing the physical research, what is it that you're actually going to be doing? Um, this is actually my favorite part of it because it is slow, because it is physical, because it takes time. So when you are given that box of material and you go in and you start looking through it, 
you're methodically going through it one folder at a time, you're opening a single folder, you're looking at the material in there. If it matches what you're looking for, great. You can keep working with it. If it doesn't, you put it back and you start with the next one. What do you actually do to, to actually work with these primary materials? So it's always, for me, as a researcher, it is always about asking myself questions as I go. It's not necessarily me asking questions of the documents or asking questions of the objects. It's asking questions of myself and what it is that I am seeing in front of me, what it is that I am touching in front of me, because oftentimes those answers or those clues can open up so many avenues for us. So think about the material's actual physical form when you're looking at it. Think, for example, let's say you are doing a search and um, you get a bunch of magazines and you want to look through those magazines. Pay attention to not just what's in the magazine itself, pay attention to, or, or a newspaper. Not, it's not just the newspaper itself, but pay attention to the, how its actual physical form what does it look like? And so actually take the time and describe in your notes what the object looks like. Think about what can you learn from actually looking at the item in its physical form? Um, you know, what can you learn about how it was made? If you're looking at the paper, if you hold the paper up to the light, do you see lines running through that paper? And if you do, um, and if it feels thick, if it feels cottony, is it possible that that paper was made by hand? Or if you hold that paper up to the light and you see little fragments of things that look like bits and pieces of wood or bits and pieces of leaves, does it, is it pulpier? So is it possible then that the paper was made by machine? And that kind of information that you get back just about how something was made can tell you a lot about the object itself. Because if something was handmade, do you think it would be more or less expensive to purchase? For example, a piece of paper. Is somebody going to spend more money on a piece of paper that was made by hand versus a piece of paper that was made by machine? It will tell you information like that. So kind of pay attention to how something was actually put together. You know, make note of those details when you're looking at an object, especially, if you're, like I said, a, a newspaper or a magazine. I'm just using this as an example. How are they actually bound? Are they stapled together? Have they been tied together? Are there paper clips? Um, have things been folded together and so they're folded like a book? Or are they just loose leaf pages that have been assembled in some way, shape, or form? So, what kinds of things do you glean from the physical object itself? Think about its condition. You know, are there smudges of dirt on it? Are there fingerprints on it? Um, has it been torn? Has it been burned? Has it been eaten with, has, has mildew gotten to it? Have bugs gotten to it? Um, if not bugs, have children scribbled on it? Have children perhaps ripped pages? Um, look at the condition that the items are in and make note of that because what you're doing in doing this kind of research is that you are building up context. You are building up a, a really robust look at what an object is and what it might actually mean other than the actual writing that might be on it. Does that make sense? Okay, so if you're paying attention then to the, the physical pieces and parts of it, perhaps something was not necessarily made by hand. Maybe it's something that was made by a company or maybe it was published by some institution or perhaps it's a photograph um, or a postcard or something of that nature. I, I put all of this under marketing because it, when you think about an object that has been professionally made, let's say a postcard, for example, or a photograph that was taken in a studio, the actual 
pieces that will identify it as something that has been professionally produced is actually going to give you a lot of information that might be really useful to you. So, for example, if you get a photograph that's been made in a studio somewhere in Pittsburgh, make note of what that studio was. And if you do a little research on that studio, perhaps it will tell you where that studio was. There were, at one point in time, down in downtown Pittsburgh, there were more than 80 photography studios just operating downtown alone. And so if you get an old picture that has the name of that studio on it, perhaps you can find where that studio was. Perhaps that you can find some, some um, promotional material from it. Perhaps you can find advertisements about that studio. Maybe you can even learn how much it costs to have that picture made. So it's building a story um, and using everything that you can glean from it to build that story. So um, think about things that might be that might be a tie-in to something else. Like for example, in our archives, we have we have comic books and coloring books, things that are made for children. They're marketed for children. You know, think about what they might be tied into. Why? What would compel a parent to buy something like that for their kid? Who was it made for? Who might have bought it? Um, and does it? Another thing that might be helpful when you're looking at those things and thinking about who is purchasing it, who is, who, is, um, who is using it, who is it made for, look at whether or not it's been sent through the mail. Sometimes, and this has been in my experience, one of the things where I get the most information is when I can see uh, postage marks on things, mm -hmm. when I can trace where an item might have come from in order to figure out where it went. To kind of track its life cycle throughout um, throughout the country, perhaps sometimes regionally. Sometimes you're even looking at something that was just sent from the post office in the neighborhood that's next to you, but it still gives you a sense of where has this been, you know, what has it seen, who has, which hands might have it might it have um, gone through. Um, so think about. It's not just the object in front of you. It's all of, again, all of these contextual clues that will help you write a story about the thing that you're looking at. Maybe these things will answer your questions. Maybe these things will actually help you figure out what it is that you're researching, or perhaps these things might actually lead you down a different path. So if you're moving on from that, like I said, context is key here. Always consider the bigger picture, especially if an item is a personal item, especially if an item is sometimes, if it's private, if it's a letter that's been exchanged. Understand that if it's a letter that has been exchanged, that was a piece of private correspondence. Those letters may never have been intended for other people to see them. It might, might have never been intended for it to have other audiences. And perhaps sometimes they did. Letters often got passed around from family member to family member. And so where something might be, might be really private, might be really intimate, might give you this really great look at somebody's day-to-day -day existence or perhaps something really difficult that they were experiencing or perhaps ideas that they might have had that they might have wanted to share with other people, maybe, maybe it's not quite so private after all. Think about all right, does this letter maybe mention other people? Does it give you a location? Does it give you a date? Does it give you even a time? Does the letter, for example, does, does somebody start writing the letter in the morning and maybe they have to go to work and maybe they pick up in the afternoon? So time will change. So kind of understand that an object that you're looking at and considering doesn't just exist on its own in a vacuum. The details that you glean from things that you're looking at, from pieces, from objects, it doesn't matter if it's a letter, if it's a postcard, if it's a diary, if it is a photograph, all of these bits and pieces, these details can help you reconstruct the world around that object. And the more you can reconstruct the world around that object, the more insight you, as the person doing the research, is going to have about 
somebody's life or somebody's experience at work or somebody's experience at home, or maybe even understanding the relationship between those two things. So always pay attention to the, the object and its physical state, how it was made, how it was put together, where it came from, and where it went. Because those are the things that, while they might not exactly answer your original research questions, they're going to help you build a much more robust story that's going to actually make the questions that you're asking a lot more interesting. So when you're working in an archive, it is physical work plan to be there for an extended period of time because it's slow. Sometimes, you know, you might not plan on being there all day, but don't plan on just popping in and out in a half hour. It's not going to take a half hour. It's going to take several hours. So when you go, budget time. Take a day. Take two days if you have it. Take a week if you've had it. I've done research trips where I go to a place for two weeks. You might not have two weeks. I understand if you don't have two weeks, but if you have a day, start there. Know that it takes time and know that it takes patience. So plan for that. When you go to an archive and you're going to that, that physical repository for the objects that you want to look at, it's always helpful to go in with a plan in place. Um, come up with that research plan before you even go. Make your notes before you even go. Kind of peruse their, peruse their catalog, peruse their search engine, make preliminary searches even before you go to that physical archive because that's gonna make your work when you get there, it's gonna make your day go so much faster and it's gonna give your archivist a lot more information to go on. Yeah, if I may, if I may yeah. cut in here for just a moment. Mm -hmm. So yes, the, the more that you know either to some extent what's in the archive, the kind of stuff they have, but even just, you know, at a baseline level, an ability to kind of know what it is you're looking for, the better, because it's going to be much easier um, for us to help you. Mm -hmm. And it's also going to be easier for you to be able to, to kind of winnow down your search. Here's what I mean by that. Um, you know, you might go in, so, you know, okay, as an archivist, I might have somebody come in, right? And I've had stuff like this happen before. I say, well, what are you looking for? Well, I'm looking for pictures of the mill. Um, and I say, okay, I got a lot of those. Do you have a specific mill in mind? And they say, oh, you know, uh, Homestead works, Duquesne works. I say, okay. So I get some pictures out for there. And, you know, and I, then I say, so, well, as I'm looking for the pictures, is there something specific, you know, within the mill that you're looking for? Well, I have pictures of, you know, maybe some guys working. Okay. So we're looking through that. And anyway, it goes on down the line until it turns out that say, you know, what they're really looking for specifically is they're looking for, a picture of a guy working in the homestead work with the actual liquid steel itself. And the thing is, it's not, here's what I always tell people, you know, this is my job. So I have all the time in the world, right? <laughs> you know, I, I'm, I'm here day in, day out. But on your end, this goes back to what, what Kirsten's saying, um, you might not have all the time. So the more when you go in that you're able to say to the archivist or whoever's helping you, um, or just know what you're looking for, right? Like specifically, if you have an image in your head of what you want, whether that is a, a, an actual image in terms of a photograph or, you know, more, you know, I'm looking for documents that touch on this issue. I'm looking for objects, you know, that have this, you know, don't be afraid to, to be specific about what you're looking for. And again, to kind of know what you have in mind, because that will make things much, much easier, um, both to, to help you find what you're looking for, but also on your end to make sure that you're able to get what you're looking for in a timely fashion. Right. right. The more the more time that, that you can take coming in and have a sense of what you want and then sit down and talk with those of us that are working there, we know our collections. Okay. So you may come in and say, you know, I'm looking for a picture of my house that was on 9th Avenue in you know, 1936. We may not have a specific picture of that house, but what we might have is a Sanborn map that shows it. Or another, you know, another map that shows it, or a photograph that's that is a little bit wider view that we might be able to find it in, or it could be ancillary to something else. So the more that we can kind of talk about it, 
and you know kind of work around what you're looking for, the better the chances are that you're going to come out of there with what you wanted. Mm -hmm. No guarantee, of course. I but, thought this always came with guarantees, Ron. Absolutely no guarantees. I, I <laughs> uh, say that all day long because we don't want anybody disappointed now, do we? Mm. So that's honestly, that's like, that's my number five on my list. Honestly, really should be number one on the list is that archivists are your friends. We are here to help you. We are here to make, um, to do our best to make sure that you find the information that you are looking for and also maybe help supplement that with other things that we know exist and that we know are in, in the collections that we think that you might think are cool. So yeah, if you come in with a pretty definite sense of this is what I'm looking for, perhaps we can help you find that and perhaps we can help you find something even cooler than the thing that you think that you want to see. Yeah, it, it's always nice when you get us excited about it too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so make friends with your archivists um, because the, the nicer you are, the more uh, open you are to suggestions, the more open you are to direction, the more open you are to having a conversation, the more robust your sources are going to be because they're going to, um, they're going to better reflect the the thing that you actually want to to explore because it's it's an exploratory mission, right? You don't go exploring in the wilderness all by yourself because you'll never be seen or heard from again. But if you take a buddy with you, um, you have a fighting chance of actually getting out. <coughs> so make friends with your archivists because they're there to help you. They're there to, um, they almost act as in, in many cases, they are another source unto themselves. Um, and just as, you know, the search engines that you plug your terms into and hope that, you know, uh, a result gets, that, that a result spits back at you, the thing that you want to, to hear or to see or to read, just as those things were built by humans and they have, you know, they have quirks like humans, sometimes the best search engine is actually talking to a person and actually talking to somebody about what the collections might have and what you might really be interested in looking for or looking at. So, you know, ask for help. You don't have to go it alone. You don't ever have to go it alone. Um, there will always be uh, resources at your fingertips. And sometimes the best resources are the people who are helping you do that research. So when you go to that archive, you know, the archivist are your friends, know your sources, have a plan when you go in. Also be aware that um, archives, as a general rule, they're cold. If any, they're, they're cold. You might be fine for the first half hour or the first hour, but then once you're there for an hour and a half, two hours, three hours, you might notice that you can't feel your nose anymore. And then you might notice that, gee, my feet are cold or my fingers are tingling. That's because these places, most of the time, they're fairly temperature controlled and they're controlled for humidity too. So even if it's July and it's a hundred degrees outside, it's not gonna be a hundred degrees inside. Bring a sweater. It's this weird thing that you think, oh, I'll be fine. I'm only going to be in here for a couple of hours. I don't get cold. You're going to get cold. Bring a sweater. Just a general rule. When you do archival research, have an archive sweater that you go that goes with you. Also, it would probably be a good idea if that archive sweater is not your favorite or your best or is a sweater that um, you aren't going to mind if it gets snagged or dusty or maybe ink gets on it or smudged. Um, archives are not always the places where you generally are uh, looking your best and that's okay. So just plan ahead. Know that, you know, going into those places, just, just the more prepared you can be, mind, body, soul, the better your experience is gonna be. Um, the other thing, just to kind of, uh, as, a, as a note, um, when you go in, most of the time, they're not gonna let you bring all your stuff in with you. 
um, because backpacks are a liability. Because backpacks mean sticky fingers can take things with them. Also, backpacks mean that if you swing the bag around, it might hit something or knock something or accidentally catch and tear something. Most of the time, you're going to be asked to leave your bags either in cubbies or in lockers or just generally outside the space where you're going to be working. So if you're going to bring paper, and I don't recommend that you bring paper, don't bring a notebook. Um, bring If you're going to bring paper, bring loose leaf paper, paper that you can spread apart and you can show the archivist that you're not taking anything back with you. Uh, don't bring a folder because the folder has pockets in it. Um, if, you know, don't bring anything like uh, anything that has ink, you're going to want to use a pencil, even though I'm in an archive right now and lo and behold, here's a pen. I don't want this. I want this. Bring a pencil. Um, if honestly your best bet, bring your computer, just bring your laptop, make sure that laptop has a full charge, make sure that, um, it's, it's ready to go with whatever note taking software you like, even if it's just a word doc, make sure that that's up and, and ready to go. Because generally speaking, that's really all you need. One other thing that you might want to have with you, and generally you can have with you, is your phone. Because your phone has a camera on it. Most of the time, provided you turn the flash off, you'll be allowed to take pictures. Um, especially if you don't intend on publishing those pictures anywhere. If you're using those pictures for personal use, take pictures of the documents that you're looking at. Take pictures of the objects. You know, get really close to it. Get as close as you want. Take pictures of those details. Um, because when you go home that night, you're going to forget details about what it is that you looked at. But if you have pictures on your phone, you can recall them. You can import them to your notes. You can do more research with those pictures that you have. Um, it's a really easy it's a, really, uh, it's a really easy and low cost way of keeping track of what it is that you're looking for or looking at. And it's a really easy way of being able to continue your own research at home when you don't necessarily have continuous access to the archive itself all the time. Um, if you don't have a phone, that's okay. You can bring a camera, just turn the flash off. You can't use the flash, but bring a camera that's fine. Um, the more tools that you have at your disposal, uh, the better. And honestly, the best tools, your laptop or tablet and your phone that can take a picture. So those are the things that you need. Bring a pencil and paper if you want. Bring your computer. Bring your phone. Don't bring a pen. You can't have a pen. Don't bring, you know, all your coats. Don't bring all your, your purses and bags and book bags. Travel light, but travel smart. Most archives would tell you before you go in mm -hmm. what you're allowed to have and not have. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. I just feel uh, we're pretty relaxed, uh, <laughs> relaxed and we ought to be. Um, but if you go to to other archives, in all seriousness, um, they they will be very strict, very strict mm -hmm. about what you can and can't bring in. Um, so mm -hmm. just check ahead. Um, yeah, and yeah, always I take it personally. Yep. Yeah, and they don't oh. mean it personally, yep. but um, it's the, in many cases, particularly things like bags. Mm -hmm. um, I, again, even even notebooks that, that have like sheathed paper in them, connected mm -hmm. notebooks, and sometimes you will we will not be allowed to bring those in. Yeah, so it is a good idea before you go to anything just check to the yep. it because they do oftentimes. Yep. And if and if um, if you're leaving and somebody and, and the archivist on duty asks you to like open up your compute like your laptop and just kind of open it and show them um, they're not searching your laptop. Don't take offense. It's just that they want to make sure that you're not taking anything. Yeah, right. and, and, and that isn't always on purpose. Okay, no. we, we have had <laughs> we have had no. That is true too. Yeah. Through the years, it's, it's completely an accident. They're shuffling yes. stuff around. It happens. Um, but it is also a reality. That mm -hmm. does happen. A and, you know, as an archive and as the archivist, we are charged with being the stewards of these objects. And so mm -hmm. no offense is attended, intended. You know, we, we, we would ask our mothers the same. Certainly ask my mom. She'd walk away with anything. Um, th there, there was another little piece that maybe you got to, but um, food and drink. 
Yeah. yeah. So if you want yes. to pour us up yep. and Ryan really likes cookies, it's a good thing. Bring them some cookies. Just don't bring them into the archives. <laughs> Leave them outside. Yeah. Yep. Um, honestly, if you want to bring a water bottle, bring a water bottle, but leave it in your bag. Leave it. You can always get up and leave your table and go out, yep. and take, a, take a break, walk around. You're probably going to want to do that anyway, especially if you're going to be in a place for several hours. You know, you're going to get tired sitting there. Your back is going to start to hurt. Your shoulders will start to hurt. Your eyes will get dry because a lot of these places are um, controlled for humidity too. So get up, walk around. Bring your lunch with you. Don't bring it into the archive. Just take a break and go get a drink then. Um, just anything that could potentially damage or um, hurt any of the objects is, is generally the things that people want to keep away as much as possible. And one, one final note about, you know, one of my favorite things about doing, doing research in an archive is being able to touch the material because um, I, I tell you, there is nothing more thrilling than like, just in, in my case, you know, I'm going to do some research in Boston and going into an archive that has some material from Louisa May Alcott. There is nothing more thrilling than opening up a diary and holding it in my hands and seeing Alcott's writing in that diary and knowing that I am touching something that she held like there's something immediate about that kind of connection and your research often it depends on you being able to touch material like that because sometimes you'll be able to notice things that you would not have otherwise noticed through a computer screen so when you touch material uh before you go into an archive wash your hands uh, I shouldn't really be touching anything right now because my hands are not clean. Uh, wash your hands. Um, soap and water will do. You do not need to um, strip them with alcohol. Just soap and water, but just wash your hands. Um, when you're touching material, be gentle. That's just like the rule of, of thumb. Just be gentle, be gentle, be gentle. Don't you know, page through something really fast. Don't, you know, bend, it, like if you're looking at a book, don't bend that spine backwards. Um, if you hear something snap, you don't want to hear something snap. Be gentle with these items because like I said, they're one of a kind, they're irreplaceable. So um, protect them. The archivists are the stewards, but um, they're entrusting you with that object. So protect them just as though you were the archivist yourself and in charge of keeping those materials safe. Um, you know, a lot of times you'll have things like book cradles to hold things in. They, we've got these really nifty paper weights that look like strings that you can use to hold something open. Um, sometimes things are in sleeves. Ask if you can remove something from its, from its protective sleeve. If you don't need to, don't remove it. Um, there will be some instances, not all the time, some instances where you might be asked to wear gloves. That's not all the time though. Most of the time it's just, it's just your hands. Um, I've heard various, various reasons for, for not wearing gloves. One of them is because it deadens the sensation in your fingertips so you can't actually feel the thing that you're touching and it makes it um, harder to to actually interact with the object if you can't feel the paper. That's just one example. But make use of the materials that are around you with those weights, with the book cradles, um, holding things flat. You know, if a paper is flat on the table, hold it flat on the table. If you're going to turn it, pick it up by the corners. Pick up the corners and turn it. Don't, you know, thumb through it. Just pick it up and move it gently. Don't stack objects on top of each other. Don't make a stack of books. Um, if you take something out of a box, put a marker in the box where you took it and return that item in that folder or return it to where, where it came from. Make sure that that order is, is preserved. Don't just jam something in a box wherever it fits. It fits in there, put it back where, where you came from. Just kind of be aware of where you are in time and space. Be aware of your physical self, be aware of your body and kind of know that you know, the things that you're touching and the way that you're touching them is just as important in your research as the material, like what you're gleaning from the material, what you're reading. Um, 
the way that you interact with it um, is also going to inform a lot of your research going forward. So just be gentle, you know, treat the objects and the items, um, not just with respect, but also know that, you know, you're kind of, you're having a conversation with them. Um, they are telling you a story. So kind of be aware of the story that they're telling you and kind of just pay attention because, um, you know, if you don't, you might miss something. And if you are paying attention, maybe you're going to get something that you didn't even expect to get in the first place. I think, was that the last? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I think since we're running just a little bit late. Yep. Um, I'm going to stop sharing the screen. Um, and if we've got uh, a little bit, we've got a little bit of time for any questions. If anybody has anything that they want to ask or, or talk about, um, we'd love to answer any questions. Well, you were thorough. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I'll add in. I'll add in one quick thing yeah. if somebody wants to again ruminate uh, on a question, but not no worries. Um, I only mentioned this just because it's something that comes up quite a bit at our archive, and I suspect if you guys, some of you are doing research out there, it might be something that you're interested in as well. Um, genealogy and genealogy mm -hmm. research. Um, oh, I do see a question. Oh, we'll get that question yeah. once back. Um, That's a good question. I just thought out of my brain. Um, it, it, this is the best thing I can say for you when you're doing genealogy research is, you know, sometimes if you're doing genealogy research, you, you have a very specific thing that you want to know. You're hunting a paper trail, right? Um, and that's what you're looking for. You're looking for documents. Um, but in many cases, you know, here's a good example. If people come to our archive and they say, you know, my dad worked at X mill, I'm looking for any record that he worked there. And in truth, outside of some very, very, very specific circumstances, and by what that, I mean luck essentially, right? Because we have what we have to a large extent. In a lot of cases, you know, there's been a lot of guys who've worked, you know, in the Mon Valley. So it's hard. It, it's hard to have that exact material. Here's, here's where I'm going with this. If something else you're looking for, though, is context about maybe what your dad did, what your grandfather did, what your great-grandfather did, whoever it might be, um, a lot of archives, a lot of places, a lot of research institutions, you know, they may not have the exact material you're looking for uh, in terms of that paper trail, but it's very, very possible that they're going to have a lot of supplementary material, which can help you fill in that picture about what that life is like. Mm -hmm. um, I just mentioned that because, again, um, you know, and it depends on the archive. I can't speak, you know, I would speak for all institutions, but, you know, depending on the place you go, just, and this goes back to something that Kristen mm -hmm. said earlier on, which is go out with an open mind, mm -hmm. but um, genealogy can be a frustrating experience, basically, is what, is what mm -hmm. I'm getting at. Right. Well, I mean, we are not, um, in most cases, a genealogical research facility. Are there materials there that are really helpful for you to understand community, to understand the workplace, to understand what went on in the workplace? Absolutely. We, we're, we are great for, a con for that context. What we probably won't be great for is to find someone's name in a ledger. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying it won't happen, but that's not really our strength. There are you know, genealogical libraries and, and, and archives that that's what they have. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. what they do. So the expectations sometimes need to be, um, for lack of a better ter term, tempered a bit. But we guarantee you, you'll come out with something that's useful and will shed a, a lot of light on the life that someone led. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that question about camera flashes. Yeah, for sure. Ron, you want to take the camera flash question? Yeah, it, the, sim the simple answer is this. Um, most of these items, special photographs um, and documents, anything handwritten, paper-based, you want to keep them out as li of, of light as much as possible. A flash on a camera is exceedingly bright. It will degrade that material. Photographs, it, for sure. E even when you know we scan a lot of items, we want to do that and this is a you know kind of a tip if you're scanning, you want to do it as, as high a resolution as possible and do it one time if you can. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And put it away because you are exposing that photograph or that document to an immense amount of light, which will break down the material. So the, the less you can do so, the better. That's the reason for no flash. If you go into an art museum, oftentimes, yeah. 
mm-hmm. you'll be bold, no flash. Yeah. Same reason. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and if you, and, and the same reason is when you go to a museum, especially an art museum, you'll notice that the galleries are not near windows. Um, and that's for that same reason, is that the exposure to light is going to degrade the material. So um, because camera flashes are so, like Ron said, exceedingly bright, even that pop of light yep. is going to do damage to the ink. It's going to do damage to the paper. It's going to do damage to the chemical, the chemical constitutions of whatever it is that, that you're photographing. Um, it will do immediate damage. And it might not be damage that you can see right away, mm-hmm. but it's going to be there. Well, well, really what it is, it becomes cumulative. Yeah. So, so we get this a lot, we get this a lot, of, you know, we, we, even with the carry furnaces, like, well, what if I go look here? Well, well, if I let you look, and then we have to let everybody look. Same thing with taking photos. You know, it, you're right. Your singular photo yeah. probably isn't going to do it. But the more that people do that, it will cause that damage. A- and then this wonderful item, this, you know, letter from, from a girlfriend of one of the, you know, um, one, one of the um, National Guard from the strike, whatever it might be, is gonna be lost. So think about that next person and what, that, mm-hmm. what, what the future is. So, you know, that's and, courteous as you can be. Mm-hmm. And for you, and again, for you at home, because Ron said it and I saw it, it was, it was mentioned again in the chat. Yeah, do be, do be cautious about scanning something a million times too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you, you definitely don't. Especially like high quality, high, high, you know, high uh, light scans like that. Do be careful because that will degrade it over time if you scan something a bunch. You kind of want to hit it good once, like Ron said, and then if possible, kind of let that rot because that, mm-hmm. that will get you. Yep. Um, so and that's yeah. another thing, if you're, if you're time crunched in your research and you only have a day or two at a place, um, most places will make copies for you. Might cost some money, generally not very much. Um, generally, you know, a couple of dollars, depending on what it is that you'd like copied. But for your own research purposes, if you can't get a picture of it yourself, um, you can always ask for a copy. Like I said, there might be a nominal fee attached to it, but um, it's it is something that a lot of places will will do without without any issue. Yeah, pretty much all archives. You mm-hmm. know, again, there might be fee, but pretty much all. Yep. Of them. Might take them a while, but they'll do it. Yeah. All right. Okay. Any other questions, anyone? Looking good. All right. All right. In that case, Thank folks. Thank you. Hey, no problem, folks. Thank you, everybody. Um, Thank you very much. Bye. Next one of these is next Tuesday. Um, you guys probably have the link, I think, on their website. Yep. Or they might send it to you. But again, join us for the last one. We'll be talking about oral histories. Um, so we're looking forward to it and uh, looking forward to uh, seeing you guys then. All, All right. right, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye now. Good night.